Why does this music sound harmonious and consonant? Whereas this music is filled with dissonance and tension. In this video, we'll continue talking about the spectrum of the Laplacian, which gives a mathematical theory for how objects vibrate and the sounds that we hear. How we perceive music is a complex topic, which depends on the context in which we're hearing it, individual taste, culture, etc. For instance, if you aren't a fan of early modern music, that excerpt from Scriven might have just sounded like random noise. Although, that might also be because I didn't play it particularly well. Music theory describes what we hear in terms of notes, rhythms, harmonies, etc. This gives the musicians a common language to express their ideas. As a complete oversimplification, in classical music, frequencies, which are a whole integer multiple, or a simple fraction of each other, are generally considered to be constant whereas frequencies, which are very similar to each other, are considered to be dissonant. I'm going to use this as a stand-in definition of consonants for this video. However, I need to make several caveats. Music theory is a huge and nuanced field, and it can't be boiled down to raw mathematics. In fact, incorporating dissonance of varying degrees is a necessary and essential part of making music. Secondly, this idea of consonants is useful for analyzing music in a 12-tone scale, but it's completely possible to make music in a totally different way, and there are many musical traditions which do exactly that. Using this simple model for consonants and dissonance, if I play this E major chord, there are four notes, and the ratios of the frequencies are roughly one, three halves, two, and five halves. As such, this is quite harmonious. On the other hand, this chord stacks together many similar notes to create tension. But this raises a natural question. Why is the sound of a single string harmonious? In the previous video, we saw that the vibrations of a single string is actually composed of many different frequencies. And in theory, these frequencies might clash with each other. However, when I play this particular string, that doesn't happen. Going back to our previous video, we saw that we could model the vibration of a guitar string according to the wave equation. And the frequencies that we hear are the square roots of the eigenvalues of the Laplace operator. For a one-dimensional string, we can solve for the eigenfunctions and eigenvalues explicitly. Here, n is just a whole number, one, two, three, four, so forth, and l is the length of the string. Since the frequencies we hear are the square roots of the eigenvalues, the frequencies we're hearing are pi n over l for n, an integer. So the dominant tone corresponds to n equals one, which will be the note that we hear. The first overtone, vibrates at exactly twice the frequency of the dominant tone, and the second overtone vibrates at three times the frequency of the dominant tone. And going back to our simple definition for consonants, this explains why a single string is consonant. The frequencies are just whole number multiples of the lowest tone. In actuality, what we're hearing is predominantly the lowest few overtones. If you play a note along with the first six overtones, this already gives a rich and dissonant harmony. For instance, if I transpose a note and the first six overtones into a single octave, it sounds a bit like this. But in practice, the vibrations of the higher overtones are much smaller in amplitude than the lower overtones, at least for this guitar. This raises the following mathematical question. How different are the first few eigenvalues of the Laplacian? In particular, what is the gap between the first and second eigenvalue? 
At least for a one-dimensional string, it's possible to answer this final question in an explicit way. The eigenvalues of the Laplacian are pi squared n squared over l squared. And as such, the first eigenvalue is pi squared over l squared, and the second is 4 pi squared over l squared. The difference between these two values is 3 pi squared over l squared, and that's our answer. This quantity is known as the fundamental gap and plays an important role in the analysis of the Laplacian. For more complicated objects, understanding the eigenvalues in the fundamental gap is much more difficult. For example, if my object is shaped like a disk, then the eigenfunctions of the Laplacian are given in terms of Bessel functions. And there is no closed form expression for the eigenvalues in terms of the simple trig functions that we're familiar with. And with a more complicated region, there's no formula for the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the Laplacian at all. In order to find them, or even estimate them, it requires some intricate PDE analysis. And generally, they can't be computed explicitly. So if I wanted to understand the vibrational nodes of a djembe, the frequencies and overtones would be completely different than that for a string. In particular, the frequencies are not simple fractions of each other, and they produce a completely different type of harmony. However, we can still try to understand the fundamental gap, and this will still relate the difference between the lowest frequency and the first overtone. Furthermore, there are many other physical processes, completely unrelated to acoustics, that can be understood in terms of the fundamental gap. As a result, mathematicians and physicists have dedicated a lot of effort to try to understand how large or small this gap can be. Discussing this work in any detail requires some background in partial differential equations and differential geometry. So I won't try to do that here. However, let me finish off with one interesting and difficult mathematical problem, which is known as the fundamental gap conjecture. This conjecture states that for a very large class of objects, the gap between the first and second eigenvalue must be at least as large as for a one-dimensional string of the same diameter, that is the same distance between the furthest points. Namely, 3 pi squared over l squared. It was independently proposed by several mathematicians and physicists in the 1980s and remained unsolved for almost 30 years. In 2011, the conjecture was finally proven by Ben Andrews and Julie Clutterbuck for objects in Euclidean space. The proof used a two-point maximum principle, which is a generalization of the traditional maximum principle. A few years later, Xu Sato, Luli Wang, and Guo Feng Wei extended this argument to objects living within spherical geometry. This was no small feat, because the curvature made the analysis much more complex and intricate. There are many open problems related to the fundamental gaps in curved geometry, and remarkably little is known about the fundamental gap for objects in positive curvature apart from spheres. To give just one example, if we have a convex domain in complex projective space, there's no known lower bound on the fundamental gap in terms of its diameter. And this is not for lack of effort. Several people, myself included, have spent a considerable amount of time on this problem, but it remains stubbornly unsolved. If one has a result for a sphere, you normally expect that the proof for complex projective space won't be too much harder. But it's almost embarrassing how little we know about fundamental gaps in this setting. I find it fascinating how seemingly simple questions about sounds and vibrations lead to deep and even unsolved mathematical problems. I also particularly like this problem because it can be explained in a way which requires almost no background knowledge and connects many seemingly unrelated phenomena. I would like to thank the Iowa State Music Department for letting me use their recital hall and the physics demonstration lab for the lasers. And as always, this video was funded in part by a collaboration grant from the Simons Foundation. That was a mistake. Take nine. Take ten. Known as white amplicate fate 
weight amplification by simulated emission of radiation. Weight amplification. It's like I'm just steadily unlearning how to play the guitar, really. I mean, that's what's going on here. <laughs>